Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this week's talk with Emily Crashman, who will be giving a talk titled Coming Up for Air, How Plants Sense and Respond to Flooding. Emily did her undergraduate degree at the University of Southampton, then did her detail with Professor Chris Schofield at the University of Oxford. She is now a research fellow in entomology, who is primarily focused on studying enzymes involved in oxygen sensitivity responses, both in plants and animals. If you have any questions for Emily during the talk, please write them in the comment section below and we will read them out afterwards. Emily, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. I look forward to hearing your talk. Over to you. And thank you very much for the invitation to give this talk. It's a real privilege to, be come, and, to come and talk to you all about the work that I do. Uh, so as Anka said, I'm, I work in the Department of chemistry and I consider myself a biological chemist, um, uh, specifically an enzymologist, so I work on enzymes and enzymes are biological molecules, proteins that catalyze chemical reactions and we're specifically interested in uh, some enzymes which catalyze cysteine oxidation and I'm going to talk to you today about how uh, um, cysteine oxidase enzymes in plants are involved in sensing and responding to uh, flooding events. Okay, so this is not just an instruction for me to calm down at the beginning of a nerve wracking talk, but it's a, it's a reminder for me to talk about how all aerobic organisms need oxygen. Uh, and we need oxygen because we, uh, through the process of uh, re respiration and metabolism, we, convert oxygen uh, and glucose to form ATP, which is the unit of energy that our bodies use. Uh, now, we as humans and animals have respiratory and circulatory systems that enable uh, us to deliver oxygen into the cells of our body. But plants don't have these, they just have to get their oxygen by diffusion. Uh, so how do plants breathe? Well, you're probably well aware that plants can photosynthesize, so they can produce oxygen by combining carbon dioxide and water with sunlight to make oxygen and glucose. So that's one source of oxygen, but that only takes place in green leaves. But they can also uh, um, acquire oxygen via diffusion, both through stomata, which are pores on, um, on the leaf surface, but also uh, diffusion through the roots via their root hairs. So this is how plants get their oxygen and the oxygen diffuses through the plant. But what happens if the plant starts to become waterlogged and flooded? Well, if that happens, then gradually the plants lose their ability to take on oxygen. And as, the, as floodwaters increase, uh, the opportunities, the available space for oxygen to diffuse into the plant is reduced. And if the plant is completely submerged, then photosynthesis stops because um, as well as uh, carbon dioxide not being able to diffuse into the plant, um, the sunlight is reduced because floodwaters are very murky. Now, um, obviously without any oxygen present, then this uh, aerobic metabolism process can't take place. And so this efficient method for producing lots and lots of this uh, ATP, the energy molecule, uh, is removed and, and um, uh, without the oxygen that can't happen. So instead what plants do is they switch to an anaerobic metabolism where um, by a, a different metabolic route, glucose is converted into carbon dioxide and ethanol and each glucose molecule forms two ATP molecules as opposed to the 38 ATP molecules that take um, that you get with aerobic metabolism. So it's a much more inefficient process. And if plants become flooded, that means that um, uh, they have to, in order to maintain an energy supply uh, for survival, they have to use up lots of glucose. So essentially they have to survive on their carbohydrate provision uh, um, uh, until the sub until the floodwaters subside, and for many plants, um, that 
that doesn't uh, the floodwaters don't subside quickly enough and so they succumb to cell death because there's not enough energy provision but also because when you convert to this anaerobic respiration process um um it, it, um it, it doesn't it sounds a bit power um what's the word what's the word i'm looking for it doesn't quite doesn't quite make sense on the face of it but you get an increase in reactive oxygen species um because you're not coupling oxygen to oxidative phosphorylation properly so this increase in reactive oxygen species also causes a lot of damage to the um the protein and uh, dna and lipids in cells leading to this type of cell death and um and crop death now there are many parts of the world where plants are uh, regularly exposed to flooding events. Um, so plants that live on floodplains have gradually adapted um, uh, through, through evolution uh, to have traits that allow them to survive uh, being flooded. And this picture gives some examples. So here we have rice. We have uh, rice that have come from a, this is a lowland variety of rice, and this is a variety of rice that's able to um, survive deep water flooding and the difference between these two types of rice is the the um, it's called the elongation so the, the sort of difference in the length between where these different um, uh, we'll call them petioles come out um, so the different branches coming off the stem the length between where these different branches come off the stem is longer in the uh, rice plant that's better adapted to survive being flooded so it reaches above the level of the flood water uh, enabling oxygen to enter the plant at the, uh, at the top of the plant. We see a similar response in Arabidopsis here. So um, Arabidopsis um, that is better adapted to flooding has got a greater length of this um, petiole. So that's the diff distance between the leaf and the stem because the, this has grown to reach above the level of the flood water. Um, similar over here, this is a sort of um, uh, uh, sort of marshy plant here, and uh, this this form of this plant here is well adapted to flooding. This uh, sh shows shoot elongation happening, so that the um, the plant can grow rapidly to reach above the level of the flood water. So this survives in in marshes. Uh, some plants have a very sort of waxy uh, surface on their leaves, which allows a, a gaseous layer to exist on the surface of the leaf to allow gas exchange even when there's some uh, when they're submerged. And then there's some adaptations in roots as well. So adventitious roots are roots that grow above the level of the soil effectively. So you can see here. Um, uh, the roots sprouting out from from above what would uh, what would normally be the soil level, and what this does is it means these if these adventitious roots develop above the level of of the flood water, or uh, this is particularly the case when it's you've just got soil water logging, then these are not surround these roots are not surrounded by water. They're they're exposed to air, and oxygen can diffuse in through these roots. Um, another. Uh, adaptation that's very important is the formation of a renchema and a renchema are basically um, uh, big holes in the plant tissue that stretch along along the stem so for example all the way up here you'd have a renchema formation um, down into the roots as well and what that does is it enables oxygen that has got into the plant via any tissue that's uh, uh, escaped above the level of, of the flood water to travel down the plant um, through the arenchyma. So it, make, it facilitates diffusion of the oxygen that's got in into the rest of the plant. And then uh, one final adaptation is um, to prevent diffusion of oxygen out of the roots. So, so we've got, oh gosh, sorry. Excuse me a minute. Just getting rid of the pet. Oh my! Can you get can you get rid of the dog? Right. Sorry. Height of professionalism. Um, okay. So you. Um, where were we? Yeah. So the roots 
so you've got these arenchyma going, coming, forming down through the shoots. So oxygen is diffusing through the plant into the roots. So what would be a real loss would be if then oxygen diffused out of the roots as it got into the roots and didn't manage to get all the way down to the uh, to right to the bottom of the roots. So you get a sort of hardening of the surface of the roots around these sorts of zones so that oxygen can't diffuse out. So that's formation of a what's called a radial oxygen loss barrier. And I've got a few more examples of adaptations um, to flooding. And these pictures were taken um, by uh, someone in the flooding field uh, when they went on a trip to the Peruvian Amazon. And it just shows some nice adaptations. Um, so this one here shows um, uh, a, a special type of fig tree which grows roots uh, which um, so, sort of exist above the level of, of the flood water so that as the flood water goes up and down over different seasons uh, the roots are exposed and allow oxygen to get into the tree. Uh, I'll come back to this one in a minute but here again we have an example in this um, water adapted hyacinth of uh, uh, petioles that have extended, so very extended petioles, so the distance between the leaf here and the stem is extended so that the leaf can get above the level of the flood water. Here again we have this internode elongation, so the distance between the formation of different leaves coming off the stem is, is very long, the plant is growing rapidly above the level of the flood, wa flood water. So most of the mechanisms that I've talked about so far uh, are escape mechanisms where the plant is growing rapidly above the level of the flood water and is, is, um, is developing adaptations to allow oxygen into the plant uh, once it has escaped out of the flood water. But another uh, mechanism which I alluded to earlier is a sort of quiescent mechanism. So the plant goes into um, a metabolic shutdown, it converts from aerobic to anaerobic metabolism and it tries to sit out the the um, the flood until the flood subsides and then um, comes back to life. It re, you know growth restarts again. And here we can see uh, a sort of gradient of vegetation uh, that that demonstrates how this happens. So you've got different layers here where you can see how the flood water goes up and then comes down, and you can see different extents of vegetation growing. That have, um, that have been initiated since the flood water has gone down. So here you've got extensive vegetation, here you've got um, less extensive vegetation, and here you've got very little because this the flood water has only just subsided from this region. Okay, so uh, all these adaptations have taken place in plants uh, that, that live in environments uh, where they're... Um, uh, so they have adapted over the course of evolution to live in environments with that where flooding can occur. So they've they've developed these adaptation mechanisms, and of course this has happened over a long period of time. But uh, these days we're beginning to experience differences uh, or what's rather increases in the uh, frequency and intensity of flooding events, and so. Uh, Plants and crops are having to are being exposed to uh, floods without the ability to adapt to flood situations, and they're not dealing with it very well. So, crops that we typically grow for food generally cannot survive submergence or flooding for long. They will go into the anaerobic uh, response, and they will use up their carbohydrate reserves, and they will have oxidative damage and uh, and they will die. So um, I'm sure you can imagine plenty of scenarios that you've seen over the news over um, the last several years, but this is an example of a, a banana, a flooded banana crop in Mozambique. Uh, this is an example of a flooded rice crop in uh, China. This is an example of fairly recent uh, flood-induced um, uh, death in uh, maize crops in um, in the US. And more locally, um, in Oxford, uh, 
allotments have regularly flooded over the past uh, decade or two. And indeed, I used to be an allotment owner. And uh, and when I had an allotment, there was one summer where there were severe floods and uh, all my produce was damaged and it was heartbreaking. And that's just a small scale allotment. And that's just me. So um, as as climate change comes upon us, uh, we can see that there's an increase in flooding. So this is just over the past, well, I mean, um, this finishes at 20, 2009. So this is the six decades leading up to 2009. And it shows that the increase in major flood events in different areas of the globe. And you can see that in particular in Asia, there's been a, a massive increase in the number of flood events. And then uh, this map shows predicted future flood events uh, with um, uh, showing how often what are, what have till now been considered 100 year event floods. It's this predicts how often they are um, they they are thought they will return in future. So the darker blue indicates the frequency with which major floods will uh, with which these regions will be exposed to major floods. So uh, we can see particular area, um, dark blue areas again in Southeast Asia, uh, in Central Africa uh, and South America. And we're not immune to that ourselves in Northern Europe. Uh, so flooding is an increasing problem. And uh, plant adaptation is uh, by natural evolution is not going to keep up. And so if we want to be able to uh, feed the nine or 10 billion people that are expected to uh, inhabit Earth by the middle of this century, then we are going to have to find ways to make sure that uh, the crops that we grow have uh, resilience to these flooding events. Otherwise, we will have a major food security problem. So, uh, we need another green revolution and uh, this is arguably underway already so many scientists around the world are looking for ways to help plants become more climate resilient so they're trying to um, find ways to make plants more drought tolerant heat tolerant uh, salinity tolerant and of course flood tolerant um and um there are I guess you, you could classify these in um, uh, these strategies into two two divisions. So uh, one would be sort of classical breeding. So trying to find uh, traits in um, uh, uh, traits in different varieties of crops that uh, enable uh enable these aspects of climate resilience typically these traits might have been bred out for for improved productivity over the past 50 years but if we can identify traits and breed them back in then that might help uh crops um uh survive different climates but also uh genetic engineering and um so identifying the pathways that underpin these adaptive mechanisms and learning from these and manipulating them uh could be uh, another effective mechanism and but both of these hand in hand uh will hopefully come together to uh, bring a suite of uh, solutions for um for crop growth in the coming decades so i'm going to talk to you now about um about the part that we hope to play in this but uh first of all i'll give you an example of a breeding strategy that's um that's really paid off in terms of flood tolerance. So there is uh, a variety of rice that was identified that has uh, particularly good uh, tolerance to flooding. So it was known to be able to survive uh, being uh, completely submerged for 14 days. And from this rare variety of rice, it was identified that the gene locus that was responsible for this flood tolerance is at a position called sub one. So the sub one gene was identified and um, the sub one gene was uh, then bred into varieties of rice that are much more commonly grown in Southeast Asia. Um, 
And what you can see here is those varieties where we've got sub one compared to, um, uh, let me find a control, IR64. So here, so here's IR64 without sub, the sub one gene, and here's IR64 with the sub one gene. And um, let's find another one. Um, so Samba, Samba over here and Samba over here. Here's Samba with the sub one gene and here's Samba without the sub one gene. So quite clearly the, um, uh, the rice varieties which have had the sub one gene cloned into them are much more resilient to being flooded. So yeah, I didn't actually explain the crucial point which is that this is a flood tolerance field with different uh, types of rice being exposed to flooding and then desubmergence and then you see what survives. So these varieties of rice have been uh, developed and distributed by the International Rice Research Institute, which is based in the Philippines. Uh, and now the, uh, these types of rice are being widely grown across Southeast Asia. And it's reported that they result in a 47% increase in rice yield in a flood year, uh, but without any yield penalty in a non-flood year. So this is a real uh, success story for breeding. Um, okay. Now, um, you could argue that um, you have to be a little bit lucky to be able to identify a, uh, a climate resilient trait uh, in a natural wild variety of a crop, and then to be able to identify the gene responsible for that trait and to um, be able to breed that into other varieties of your plant. So it, um, that situation that I've just described with sub one being bred into different rice, rice varieties, that's not going to be applicable to all crops. Um, it's just that there was that rice variety that was particularly uh, tolerant that they could exploit. Uh, so, um, so we turn instead to the possibility of understanding the molecular pathways behind this tolerance and being able to engineer those pathways uh, as another route to generating uh, flood tolerant crops. So to be able to do that, you need to understand the molecular mechanisms involved. And uh, these were really deduced in plants about, uh, well, over the past 10 or 15 years. And it really started with the rice story so that the identification of the sub one locus really helped piece together what the um, flood tolerance molecular mechanism uh, is. So here we have our plant uh, and it's uh, surviving quite happily in air. But when it becomes submerged, the diffusion of gases is reduced. This leads to a buildup of ethylene in the plant because Plants continuously produce ethylene, but it just diffuses out of the plant. But if the plant is surrounded by water, the ethylene can't diffuse out as readily in water as it can as air. So this ethylene acts as a signal and it uh, acts as a signal to accumulate certain transcription factors. Um, and we'll come on to that in a, in a minute. But it um, in rice, you see accumulation of two different families of transcription factors. We have the sub uh, family of transcription factors and they inhibit gibberellin production and that uh, prevents uh, elongation. So um, without the gibberellin, there's no growth and that triggers the uh, plant to go into this metabolic shutdown. It's not growing. We also get induction of genes which enable the uh, plant to switch from aerobic to anaerobic metabolism. Over here, however, we have, um, so in different varieties of rice, which show different responses, depending on um, uh, what type of flood they're adapted to. So this type of rice is adapted to uh, shallow floods and that might have a long duration. So this type of rice, as we've seen in some of the photos that I showed you before, grows rapidly above the level of the flood water. And this response is driven by transcription factors called SK or snorkel. And snorkel describes 
the arenchyma that I described. So these these sort of gappy formations along the the stem, they're essentially forming snorkels from the from the top of the plant where air can get in all the way to the bottom uh, with oxygen able to uh, diffuse to the plant tissue from, from the arenchyma within the plant itself. So we've got transcription factors driving these two different responses, the elongation response and the quiescence response. And the, um, the snorkel transcription factors do this by turning gibberellin production on. So gibberellin drives growth and that's what drives the growth to, uh, to elongate out of the, um, out above the level of the flood water. Okay, so we've got uh, accumulation of transcription factors. And so um, transcription factors are proteins that promote expression of certain genes. So these transcription factors will promote the expression of genes that drive the adaptive response in the plant. And um, the clue to the flood, uh, you know, the um, connection to the flood adaptive response really came from looking at the sequence of these transcription factors. And so there's um, different examples of these transcription factors in rice, so S from the SK and the subfamily, and also their equiv equivalence in Arabidopsis. And Arabidopsis is um, the plant, uh, the model plant organism used in uh, plant lab work, uh, and it's a, a it's called thalecress. It's it's a it's basically a weed. Um, and what was noticed about these transcription factors is that when you looked at the sequence of these transcription factors, first of all, they're uh, very similar uh, when you compare all these different um, uh, transcription factors, and I'll call them earth transcription factors. They're group seven ethylene response factors. Um, so they're, uh, they're very similar, but crucially, um, all of them, uh, except one, the relevance of which uh, is uh, questionable, but I uh, um, can come back to that. Um, all of them have an M and a C at their end terminus. So the end terminus is the start of a protein. So if you imagine you've got a, a protein molecule and you've got um, two residues, a methionine and a cysteine. Now, when um, proteins get uh, made in the cell by the ribosome, uh, many of them will have their initial methionine cleaved off, so removed at the point of protein production. And if you've got a cysteine at the second position, then this methionine is usually removed. So that means that uh, effectively at the end terminus, once the methionine here has been removed, you've got a cysteine residue represented by C here, uh, at the end terminus of all of these transcription factors. So why is this important? Okay, now there's a, uh, a pathway or a certain phenomenon that describes that the identity of the amino acid at the end terminus of a protein will have an effect on the stability of that protein. And that's because having certain amino acids at the end terminus of a protein will destabilize it. It'll send it to what's called the proteasome here, which is effectively the cellular dustbin. So this pathway is called the N-Degron pathway. And some of the residues that are destabilizing are um, indicated here. So um, cysteine here is not destabilizing by itself. However, if cysteine gets oxidized, then um, that oxidized form of cysteine becomes a substrate. So it, it gets recognized by a different enzyme, which adds an arginine to make a new end terminus. And that arginine uh, is a signal for uh, the next step in the process, which sends the protein for degradation by the proteasome. So what we have then is a connection between cysteine, oxygen, and degradation of the protein. So if we think then back to our earth transcription factor, if, we're, if we've got a high oxygen environment, which we would do when a plant is not flooded, then we have the cysteine 
at the end terminus of our transcription factor that gets oxidized and that oxidized cysteine has an arginine attached to it and that gets sent for degradation by the proteasome. So your the earth transcription factor is destabilized and does nothing. If you have a reduced oxygen environment, as you do when, uh, when your plant is flooded, uh, because the oxygen can't diffuse into the plant, then that cysteine oxidation does not take place and your transcription factor is stabilized to induce the expression of genes which allow the plant's adaptive response to being flooded. So we have a connection between uh, oxygen av availability and the uh, molecular response. Now, I'm just gonna um, sidestep for a minute to highlight the similarities between this system where we've got regulation of the stability of a transcription factor um, uh, by the availability of oxygen and a uh, equivalent system in humans. In humans, there's a transcription factor called HIF, hypoxia inducible factor. And when and HIF is stable in low oxygen conditions to induce the expression of genes which allow us to respond to low oxygen. And those would be genes that, um, that um, lead to the production of uh, red blood cells and the formation of blood vessels. But in normal oxygen conditions, uh, HIF is also oxidized, this time at a proline residue, and that's a signal for HIF to get sent to the proteasome, the, the cellular dustbin. Uh, and so it's not, um, HIF is not acting under normal conditions. And this is a really important pathway that um, has uh, been studied extensively in Oxford and beyond, and um, the discovery of this pathway uh, was awarded uh, the uh, Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in 2019, including uh, Peter Ratcliffe from Oxford. The, uh, the important point that I want to highlight to you from the human system is that uh, the oxidation event of the HIF, so where you've got the proline, is oxidized to a hydroxyproline, this oxidation event is catalyzed by an enzyme and it's catalyzed by an enzyme called HIF hydroxylase and that incorporates, so HIF hydroxylase catalyzes the incorporation of molecular oxygen into the proline and it's that uh, event which sends uh, the HIF for degradation and the HIF hydroxylases are very oxygen sensitive enzymes allowing a gradient, a graded response from high to low oxygen. So when a few years after this uh, pathway was identified, there, a set of enzymes were identified uh, call, which were called the plant cysteine oxidases and they were proposed to uh, catalyze the oxidation of cysteine to oxidize cysteine. Uh, that really made a lot of sense because having enzymes that control this important oxidation event um, is a way of regulating this whole pathway. Uh, so these enzymes, um, uh, so I sh um, these enzymes were discovered uh, by the group of uh, Francesco Licausi, um, who's uh, since become a close collaborator and also recently moved to Oxford to work in the Department of Plant Sciences. So um, this is where. Uh, we come in. So my group has had a long standing interest in oxygen sensing enzymes. And so when these enzymes were identified, uh, we were very keen to uh, look at them and uh, determine whether they could play a part in regulating um, uh, the plant's uh, response to low oxygen and flooding. So I just check the time, see how much detail I've got time to go into. So um, there's a, li uh, a bit of um, uh, a bit of detail chemistry here to show the work that we did in our group, which validated that the that these uh, plant cysteine oxidases were indeed catalyzing the cysteine oxidation. So first of all, we use mass spectrometry with um, oxygen and heavy oxygen to demonstrate that the enzymes incorporated. 
molecular oxygen from the atmosphere into the uh, oxidation of the cysteine, which they do. So they are dioxygenases using molecular oxygen. We showed that they were indeed uh, incorporating this molecular ox oxygen into the N-terminal cysteine of the uh, of, of peptides representing the earth transcription factor substrates. And we showed that the product of the PCO catalyzed reaction is uh, cysteine sulfonic acid. And then importantly, uh, we teamed up with some collaborators uh, from the Institute of Plant Biochemistry in Halle in Germany, who were working on the arginyl transferase enzyme to show that the next step in sending the proteins for degradation, which is the addition of an arginine to the N-terminus, um, we showed that that was only possible um, uh, with a um, cysteine initiating peptide, um, that the arginylation represented here by incorporation of radioactive arginine was only possible in the presence of the, um, of the PCO enzymes. So these N-terminal cysteine had to be oxidized before it could be arginylated. And we demonstrated that uh, with mass spectrometry back in Oxford as well. The next thing we showed uh, was that the uh, PCO enzymes were oxygen sensitive. Uh, so um, here we have uh, kinetic experiments uh, carried out with the five different PCO enzymes that you find in Arabidopsis. And what we're doing here is we're measuring the rate of enzyme activity as a function of oxygen concentration. And what we found is that the rate of enzyme activity for all the enzymes was dependent upon oxygen concentration. But not only that, the sensitivity to oxygen concentration was um, uh, to a point that corresponds with the types of oxygen concentration that you find in plant cells and tissues. So what do I mean by that? Let's take this example over here. So if we compare PCO5 and PCO4. For PCO5, uh, we have, um, let's call it uh, less sensitive, uh, it's less sensitive to oxygen uh, compared to PCO4, which is very sensitive to oxygen. And what I'm looking at is the gradient of the slope here. So for PCO4, which is very sensitive to oxygen availability, if we if the oxygen availability dropped from 20% to 10%, then you see a significant drop in the enzyme activity. So if you see a drop in enzyme activity, you're going to see a stabilization of the earth transcription factor because the enzyme's no longer working to send it to the uh, cellular dustbin. PCO is a bit less sensitive. If you drop from 20 to 10% oxygen, you see less of a, a dramatic effect. But what we do see here is over... Amongst the five different enzymes, we see a, a range of different sensitivities, but all of them are within the within physiologically relevant oxygen concentrations, which means that if you have deviations from these um, oxygen concentrations seen in uh, cellular tissues and cells, then you're going to get changes in in oxygen in sorry changes in the activity of the PCO enzymes. So these initial studies. Um, validated the reaction that the PCOs catalyze, um, demonstrated that PCO activity is necessary and sufficient for regulation of Earth-7 stability, demonstrated that the rate of PCO activity is sensitive to oxygen availability, and so importantly showed that the PCOs are, oxygen sen are an oxygen sensing component, or sorry, are the oxygen sensing component, or okay, to be completely correct, are to date the identified oxygen sensing component of the flood signaling pathway. Okay, so what can we do with this information? Well, there's evidence that stabilizing earth transcription factors can help improve flood tolerance in plants. So we can see that here, with Arabidopsis, which has an upregulation of RAP 2.12, which is one of its earth transcription factors. You can see that in those plants which have that 
um, upregulated, so more of the earth transcription factor is present, you get a better recovery after submergence compared to those that don't have it. Um, over here, we've got a barley plant uh, where the, um, the final step in the pathway, so the bit that sends the uh, earth protein to the dustbin, that part of the pathway has been knocked out uh, temporarily. Uh, so that led to a stabilization of the earth transcription factor. And it's less um, uh, visually obvious, but you have a better recovery in this barley plant than in this barley plant to the flooding. But most dramatically, we see it over here with the rice that I was showing you before. So sub 1A is an, is an earth transcription factor in rice. And sub 1A is um, unusual because it in, is inherently stable. So it is not for whatever reason that we don't fully understand, but it is not sent for degradation by the proteasome. And we've already seen that having this earth transcription factor present in rice plants confers significant flood tolerance. So what that suggests that is that um, altering this pathway to have um, stabilized earth transcription factors uh, could have beneficial effects in terms of generating flood tolerant crops and manipulating PCOs could be a way to achieve that. Interestingly, PCO sequences are highly conserved amongst crops. Um, I won't go into the details, but basically the more red you see, the more, the more identical or similar um, the, the regions of the protein are. And so PCOs are highly conserved. They're present in all crops, all plants, everything you look back to, right back to algae. Um, and um, so what that suggests is that if we find a way to manipulate PCOs in, for example, the model plant in Arabidopsis, then we could most likely apply that same uh, mechanism by engineering the same parts of the protein uh, and the same parts of the enzyme, sorry, in different in PCOs from different crops. So our strategy is to manipulate PCO activity uh, in an efficient and targeted way to stabilize the earth transcription factors and improve flood tolerance. So I'll just take a couple of more minutes just to show you where we are with this so far. Uh, so what we've managed to do and publish this year is uh, find the structures of two of these enzymes from Arabidopsis. So here we have, um, uh, this one is ATPCO4. Um, so this is one of the more oxygen sensitive enzymes. And here we have an iron at the active site and we've got histidine residues which sort of lock the iron in place. And the iron um, is necessary because that activates the oxygen molecule to oxidize the cysteine residue. We've got a, a nice open active site cavity which we suspect has something to do with um, the protein substrate binding and, and allowing the earth transcription factor to bind with the cysteine getting right in there to the active site. And we've got um, an understanding of the amino acids uh, close, well, in the active site of the enzyme. So the kind of chemistry that we have close to the active site where the actual cysteine oxidation event is gonna take place. So all these, all these um, amino acids here will be doing something that contributes to the efficient cysteine oxidation. But we don't know what they're doing, uh, so we have to do experiments to find out what the role of all these uh, amino acids is and whether we could manipulate any of them to change PCO activity. So the first thing we've done is to make some variants. Um, so a variant is basically making a version of PCO4 where we swap one amino acid for a different amino acid with different chemical properties. Um, and I'll just draw your attention to two variants which more or less completely knocked out enzyme activity. So H164D, that, so that's replacing this uh, histidine, it is, um, with an aspartate. Um, so what that does is it changes the iron coordination at the active site. We didn't actually think this would do anything because what we replaced it with, aspartate, is also known to be able to bind uh, iron, but it clearly did have an effect. 
Uh, and we also mutated this residue as spartate, which is a negatively charged residue, and we changed it to something that's quite similar, asparagine, uh, but doesn't have the negative charge. Uh, and both of those mutations uh, had a dramatic effect. So the, the variants that we generated uh, had very little to no activity. And so we took these two variants and we put them into uh, we put them into plants. And so we did this with the help of Francesco Lucauzi, who's um, who originally identified these enzymes. And he's got a, a version of Arabidopsis where he's knocked out four of the PCO enzymes. You can't knock them all out because otherwise the plant doesn't survive. Um, but you can knock out four. And uh, so here we have the knockout and here we have wild type. And what you can then do with the knockout is you can then replace some of the enzymes. So you could re you could replace the, uh, the sequence for the PCO4 uh, with the wild type PCO4 sequence. And you get a plant that looks very healthy, looks very similar to actually the wild type plant where that hasn't had any manipulation. Um, so we've reconstituted uh, the phenotype here by adding the PCO4 wild type back in. Um, but when we added the two mutations back in, so our variants H164D and D176N, those variants didn't reconstitute the function of um, the PCO. So we didn't reconstitute the phenotype. They look pretty, pretty poorly, similar to the similar to the knockout. Um, and so that shows that the effect that we saw. Uh, biochemically with our um, with our variants here in the test tube were carried over in when we uh, took the same variants into plants and you could even just go back and forth again so we had a, a small amount of activity with the d176n and we saw we saw a slightly better phenotype uh, with when that variant was introduced um, uh, into the knockout plant cells so we what this does is it demonstrates uh, a proof of principle that changes we make to the enzyme biochemically uh, can be implemented into the plant and we, we see a similar effect. Um, but of course, there's a long way to go. So what we're doing now uh, is we're looking at a whole host of other mutations around the active site and we're looking for things that don't uh, um, impact the phenotype of the plant so dramatically as this. Obviously, we don't, you know, this is not much good. We're not going to get much crop yield if this is the type of mutation that we incorporate into our PCO enzymes. We're looking for something that's going to alter perhaps the oxygen sensitivity so that the window um, of time where the earth transcription factors are stable is increased. So they're stable for longer, but we're not completely um, uh, turning them on permanently because that leads to a reduction in yield. And um, we're not completely knocking out PCO activity to do so because that obviously uh, has a detrimental effect. And we also, as, as part of this, we also have to understand what else the uh, PCOs are doing in plant cells to be able to make our, um, our interventions specific to the manipulation of the earth transcription factors. So uh, to conclude, Hopefully, what I've conveyed to you is that uh, reduced oxygen availability and metabolic crisis are a major threat to flooded plants. Um, but plants have, uh, over time, evolved adaptive mechanism to help them survive periods of flooding. However, with the effects of climate change coming on, these adaptive mechanisms are not enough. Both We need to think both about um, uh, crops which don't have adaptive mechanisms and can't survive being flooded for very long at all. Uh, maize is one example that um, is really susceptible to flooding. Um, but also even those plants that, that are adapted to flood. So the, these rice plants that can survive for two weeks underwater, the extent and duration of the flooding that is being seen now in Southeast Asia is, is so much that um, uh, being, uh, um, being able to survive flooding for 14 days is not enough because the floods are lasting longer. However, uh, I believe we can give plants a helping hand. Um, and 
uh, one way of doing that is to have a detailed understanding of flood response pathways to identify strategies for molecular intervention. Uh, so effectively, we're doing um, we the end point of this would be gene editing in crops, so uh, editing the genes which encode for PCOs. Um, and overall, uh, I believe that genetically engineered crops have a critical part to play in climate climate a resilient agriculture. OK, so it just uh, remains for me to thank um, people involved in the work. So uh, these are the members of my current members of my group um, and uh, a couple of key uh, past members of my group in italics who've uh, contributed to this work. Um, so we've got work on PCOs and flood tolerance. We're also interested in PCO evolution, looking back to algal PCOs. And um, there's a really cool um, so equivalent enzyme to the PCOs in, in humans, which also has an important role in human hypoxic responses. I'd like to thank uh, collaborators in Oxford. I'd like to thank uh, collaborators elsewhere. I'd like to thank uh, UKRI and the ERC for funding. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Emily, so much for such an insightful talk. Uh, so we've got a couple of questions on, from the audience. Let's let me read out the first one. OK, let me see. Uh, so this one is more of a comment than a question. It says the dog is awesome. Please don't tell, tell it <laughs> from Max. <laughs> Sorry about the dog. <laughs> no, I think I think she was I think she was very popular. If anyone, <laughs> She's not barking at her reflection her own reflection in the window yeah. <laughs> but i think if anything it's more of a shame that we didn't actually get to see her in, oh. in the flesh oh sorry i Next uh, my professional head on <laughs> all right let's let's have a, a another an actual question now um okay so this one's from sarah do you reckon it is possible to produce uh flood resistant crops by traditional selection breathing me uh, methods? Um, I think it's possible in some instances. So, um, so there, you know, if you've got a crop that um, has a wild relative that mm. is particularly tolerant to being flooded, and you can identify if, if that, um, if that tolerance is driven by one protein, then the gene for that protein will be in one particular locus in, in the genome of that um, wild relative. And if you can identify that and then put that into the crop, then yes, that's going to work. Um, I So there is definitely a place for that in this whole strategy. But I think I... I don't think that we would be lucky enough to be able to identify such strategies for all the crops that we need to do that for. So I think both the uh, traditional breeding and the um, genetic engineering need to go hand in hand. So you think there's probably just too many genetic variables um, for, for like all the plants possible out there that we would need to make flood resistant for it to actually just rely purely on um, previous standard methods used for selective breeding. I think so. I mean, a geneticist might argue argue against it, uh, argue against me, and say that uh, uh, traditional breeding would be better. But I, I think it's slow. So I think if we could, um, uh, by understanding the fundamental pathways that drive these responses, uh, that are conserved in all plants then we have mechanisms for genetic engineering that we can implement without the traditional breeding. Okay. Yeah, that's, yeah, I guess traditional methods will just, you need probably more than one or two generations for it to actually show up the flood resistant genes that you're, you're looking for. Yeah. And it's, it's a, it's a lot of work. I mean, so is this, but um, I think the two things have to happen at the same time. And that, you know, there are lots of people doing traditional breeding. So, um, uh, in IRI, for example, at the International Rice Research Institute, there's a lot of, of breeding of traits going on. So, so crossing different uh, rice varieties to try and breed better, stronger, more resilient varieties. That's a that's a major part of their work. So it is happening. Uh, yeah, that sounds pretty cool. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, let's get the next question. 
Uh, so this is from Tom. Uh, has CRISPR-Cas gene editing systems allowed you to rapidly test various gene modifications that would enable plants to thrive in flooded areas, such as genetic tricks from borrowing genetic tricks from rice and that sort of thing? Yeah. So I, um, the way I see CRISPR, I think CRISPR is going to be the tool with that we use to. Uh, introduce the variants that we uh, that we engineer into mm -hmm. plants. I think what would be a better tool for well, I don't know, arguably a better tool for us for sort of rapid screening would be a directed evolution type method of looking at different variants at the active site. However, um, uh, for directed evolution, you need a lot of things in place um so you would um it's not necessarily uh the be all and end all so i i i'm having sort of thought it all through i think the rash the targeted rational approach uh is the most likely to lead to useful outcomes given the tools that we have at our disposal at the moment okay yeah, I mean, in general, it just sounds like for this sort of thing, you just need a combination of different tools. You can't really rely on one single method to fix yeah. the problem. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, let's have, I think we've got time for one more question. Uh, so if we can get that one up. Uh, oh, this is an interesting one uh, from Millie. It says, what sort of effects could uh, these flood resistant plants have on biodiversity in the environment? Oh, interesting. Um, so I'm just going to have to sort of think this through on the hoof. Um, <laughs> um, my natural reaction is to, uh, is to think that the, it's not going to negatively impact on biodiversity um i what i go i suppose what we're not doing what what hmm, you know we're not using wild varieties uh um which which show climate tolerant traits we're not using those and introducing those into the the you know, sort of wider general agriculture. However, uh, however, um, I don't think so. So we're not increasing biodiversity in that aspect. We're um, we're probably maintaining the status quo. Um, right, okay. uh, we're a lot. Yeah. So we're maintaining the status quo. I think probably other, you know, other people need to think about. <laughs> that sounds bad, um, but um, biodiversity could be better maintained with different types of strategies. So I would see that as something very different. So um, you might have. Uh, pest resilient crops so so there are people yeah. who are working on pest resilient crops uh, and um, what these do is they uh, they allow crops to survive in the presence of certain pests mm -hmm. uh, and that then means you don't have to apply so much pesticide and that has beneficial effects for biodiversity so I think what we're doing in terms of flood tolerance is not going to is, is not really touching on any of that but the same kind of strategies are being used by people um uh for uh in, yeah in terms of pest tolerance which would have a positive impact on bio i would anticipate to have a positive impact on biodiversity wow. yeah yeah interesting it's a it's a i never really thought about that, that much before it's a good question yeah so i saw something today in fact which um it was a real sort of um rational and controlled study on the effect of 
um, genetically modified aubergine growth oh. uh, in Bangladesh, I think it was. So it was it was a sort of a controlled trial, and they looked at um, uh, these aubergines that have been genetically uh, modified mm. to have um, with a, with a gene from a bacteria which has an insecticide in it specific to the um, to the pest that is the problem, and they. Um, uh, what they saw was a basically the amount of pesticide that people were having to apply was significantly reduced, and the yield of the aubergine was going, was significantly higher. Um, and and at, along with that, the the health of the people who normally go and spray this pesticide was also significantly better. But the fact that you've managed to genetically engineer this crop uh, that means that you don't need to spray as much pesticide on your crop mm. as um as uh presumably or hopefully uh got positive impacts for the biodiversity in on those fields do you do you think there's a potential risk though that um crops that are very uh that are resistant to sort of pesticides or uh or pests or insects or whatever might end up out competing some native plants that might be in the weird nearby wilderness and then that could potentially lead to some negative effects or do you think that would be quite a negligent um effect on the bio mm, i think that that would be very um specific so i you know if you imagine you're growing your aubergine plant which has got better uh, pest resistance i don't think that's going to unless um you've got a neighboring wild uh aubergine yeah. plant then i don't think it's going to have any impact on plants growing nearby okay, okay. Yeah. so it has to be, yeah okay it would have to be something really closely related to it really have a really negative impact on it i think so but we are we are off my area of expertise so. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, unfortunately that's uh, that's all we've got time for this evening thank you so much to everyone who's tuned in and asked questions and Emily thank you once again so much for such an interesting talk it's, oh, been, an it's been an honour to have you join us next week where we will be hosting Akane Kawamura who will be discussing the topic of epigenetics enjoy the rest of your evening everyone and stay safe, Good night.